Welcome to Fantasy Sports Daily with Ray Flowers, Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to use the promo code FSD20 for a 20% discount on the products over at FantasyGuru.com. Hey there, folks. Welcome to Fantasy Sports Daily, which you can hear right here, here, right here. I always start out well in the morning, don't I? Yes, I do. 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. Find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash plus network. If you watch the show live there, you can also see it, right? See the, the things we show on the screen and see my face as I talk. If you're into that, you can also type in Fantasy Sports Daily to your local podcast network. See if it pops up. It should. Um, then you can also always find the show over stored at fantasyguru.com. Click the Elite Plus tab at the top in the toolbar and you will find what you are looking for. Again, I'm Ray Flowers. You can find me in the social media verse um, at the Ray Flowers. So check out at the Ray Flowers. Type it into your your local spots there. You probably find me too uh, in those spots. Uh, I'll be answering questions at the end of the show. So if anyone wants to ask away, ask some comments there. Fire them away in the the the, the, the different areas. YouTube being the main one. Facebook as well. Uh, and I'll answer those late. You can always obviously sign me send me questions. Excuse me over at fantasyguru.com in the Discord. Already been answering questions this morning. What are we talking about on the show today? Don't play the game scared. I had an interesting back and forth in that Discord this morning, and I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about that here. Uh, What do I mean by don't play scared? We'll find out in a second. Weather spoiling more games. Um, That is not, I mean, (laughs) just so everyone knows, I do the cash game breakdown too, right? For the the DFS side of things at fantasyguru.com. And for those people that are, are curious, right? Which hopefully you all are, you can get the MLB seasonal package, the MLB betting package, the MLB um, DFS package, all three packages. You can get them separately and get them all together. Uh, you can see it on the screen there. Just go to the fantasyguru.com, click the join now tab on the top right. Uh, and I do the cash game breakdown. Anyway, when you do the cash game breakdown, we have a limit of five games. If it's less than five games, like a four game slate, uh, we say just play GPP, right? Because you, you get too narrow. You, you, start, you start taking too many risks. There's not enough of a floor, right? It's, it's more of a risk-based game, which is more the GPP thing. So Major League Baseball, you know, has a small slate of Thursday games because it's a travel day. Uh, they had five games on the slate today. So I waited. In the last Yesterday, the, the game with the Mets was canceled. Mets and Braves got canceled, as you're all aware. Game gets canceled. We're not positive who's starting today. We're assuming it's uh, Wyans and Quintana, but it's not confirmed. So I'm trying to find that information out for today's slate. Couldn't find it. Started the write-up last night. Did what I could. Um Check before I went to bed to see if any of the games were rained out because I knew weather was in play today. Checked, checked the games last night. No no cancellations. Checked it late last night at 11.30. No cancellations. Go to bed. I get up at 4.30 in the morning today. 4.45. 4.44 for being technical. 4.44 in the morning, I get up today to write the cash game breakdown. I immediately check my phone to see if any of the games have been canceled because of the weather because, again, I know weather's in play. None of the games have been canceled. So I get up at 4.45 in the morning, 4.44, in the dark. Uh, the only creature in the world that's up is my cat who comes downstairs with me bang out you know two hours of writing to help you know bring the the article up to to speed then we get the announcement that the tigers and the twins game is canceled and so all the work i did really (laughs) goes out the window the article is still posted over fantasyguru.com if you want to read it as is highlighted in the article itself there's now only four games on the slate if none of the other games get canceled because of weather and that makes playing cash games very difficult. But I didn't want the information that I created to go to waste. So you can still use it if you want to play GVP today, which would be more of my recommendation, play a GVP versus cash. I bring this all up because this is a running theme here on the show. We either talk about injuries to pitchers or weather every single day. I don't understand this. Build freaking stadiums with roofs or play games on the West Coast. It's absolutely ridiculous. It just... I, it fries my gears. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my energy providing content that's not even useful. You're not being able to do what you want to do, which is play the game of fantasy baseball because games are getting canceled. Matchups are getting changed. You know, if you're in a roto league, it's going to get made up. Well, we think it's going to get made up. The game from yesterday was September 26th. We'll see if they actually play that game, but it'll get made up. So if you're in a roto league, you're fine. If you're in a, if you're in a league that sets your lineup once a week, any format, you're this hurts losing a game that's not going to be played till September. If you're in a head-to-head scenario and you were planning on playing Braves or Mets at any point this week, it hurts because the game's not till September. This sucks. It sucks for the baseball fan. It sucks for the person playing DFS. It sucks for the person playing seasonal. 
Build stadiums with roofs or play games on the West Coast. It's not that complicated. Play games on the West. And if that means the West Coast is where the games are played in April, and that means come you know July all the games are on the East Coast, so be it. Play all the, the games in April on the West Coast. Play all the games in September on the West Coast. Problem solved. We'll get rid of 80% of the rain problems we have. Wish Major League Baseball would do that. We'll go back to talk about don't play the game scary in a few minutes here. I just want to get that off my chest because, as you can tell, I'm angry. I, but usually I'm, I'm having trouble speaking in the morning. I did start out a little slow today, but I should be fine because I've been up for hours. Uh, I'll talk about a lot of things that have gone on the last 24 hours. Jackson Holiday, you know, he made his Major League debut. Eric Getty made his Major League debut with the Astros. Uh, we've got guys like Jordan Hicks pitching well, Lance Lynn pitching well, so-so efforts from guys like Chris Paddock and Bobby Miller. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Struggling Nico Horner, a health update on uh, uh, Kodai Senga, uh, and some more issues with baseball. We'll also talk some football. In about a half hour, Russell Clay will join us. We'll talk some football with him. He's our dynasty guy, but of course he does tons of just regular football. So we'll have a little bit of break from the baseball to talk some football with Russell here in a bit. Uh, don't forget to use that promo code FSD20, FSD20, for a discount on the products over at FantasyGuru.com. And again, you can get all three baseball packages, MLB Wagering, MLB DFS, MLB Seasonal, right now. They're all still available. They're all still helpful. They're all still going to help you win in 2024. You can also get all three of them together or all three of them solo. You can get two of the three of them solo. You can just get one of the three if you want. But all three are available over at FantasyGuru.com. Okay. Don't play the game scared. What do I mean? I had an interesting back and forth in Discord this morning uh, with one of our users who's very active. And he basically said, look, I, I need pitching. My pitching staff's not very good. I went heavy hitting. You know, my, I know I need to bolster my pitching. I'm talking about, I'm thinking about making trades. Uh, I'm thinking about making moves, but I'm like, I just, like, what happens if I make a move and, and Max Fried doesn't return to form? Or what happens if Kevin Gaussman gets hurt? And my comment was basically, and I wanted to expand on it here at the start of the show, my comment was basically, you can't play this game scared. You can't play any game scared. You can't. Now, maybe my harping on the injuries day after day after day after day after day has created fear. Not fear, but you know what I'm saying. Fear in the fantasy space or fear with the users at fantasyguru.com that every pitcher's arm is going to fly off. Even if every pitcher's arm is going to fly off, even if that fear is warranted, you still need pitching. If you are paralyzed by fear right now, it can be very tough for you to win. If you say to me, well, Ray, just look around. This is why I keep asking, will you play in an offense-only league? This is why I keep asking, will you play in team pitching leagues? I think a team pitching league is terrible. I don't want to do that. But at the same time, I don't want to be losing my fantasy league every year because you know half my pitching staff is hurt by August 15th. You know, people just say, oh, just grab the next guy. And I understand that. There will always be someone to throw the innings. That's not the point. But when you start going from SP3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 8 to 9 to 10, when you start talking about guys at double A that none of us have seen at the big league level, none of us broke down, none of us expected to be big-time producers. We're talking about that double A pitcher now making 14 starts this year because of all the injuries ahead of him. You've raised the level of uncertainty and you raise the level of risk exponentially. Just through the roof. That's not an ideal way to play a fantasy sport. Don't play scared, though. I mean, you, you have to play the situation with the way it is. Everyone's got pitching problems. Everyone's going to have pitching problems. I have directly said this, and, I, and we really hit on it the last you know couple of days here, last week and a half on the show, because pitchers every day are going down. Yesterday, we didn't have a catastrophic injury unless I'm forgetting one, which is fantastic news. News that there is no news is not good news, but you get the point. I've been directly hitting on this since 2020 with COVID, over and over and over and over. And okay, this is not something new. My my take of, oh, don't drive pitching early. Oh, be nervous about pitching. I've always said wait on pitching. I thought that for 15 years, 20 years, actually. It's basically since I started in this industry, 25 years ago, I always said wait on pitching. Since COVID, I've hammered the wait on pitching thing. Okay. And we've seen why that is. Because, you know, SP82... And SP8, both guys could blow their arm out. SP82, I'm taking in the 23rd round. SP8, I'm taking in the third round. There's a huge difference in terms of the cost, right? So that's been the point of view. But the fact is, no one's in an offense-only league. I am, but no one else is. No one's in a team pitching league. So everyone needs pitching. So you're, you're going to have to take risks if you have a poor pitching staff. You're going to have to take risks if you've got injury. Maybe that risk is running Kyle Hendricks out there. 
Maybe that risk is adding Robbie Ray and hoping he returns to form midseason for the for the Giants and is terrific in the second half. Maybe that risk is making a trade. You know, I will say that you know, just the trade market's probably the best way to do this. And you know, the trade market move to make is is not to go out there and say to everyone, "All right, I don't want to get Zach Wheeler, who's pitching great." That's not the move. Zach Wheeler is going to cost a gazillion dollars. Make a move on other pitchers that are struggling a little bit. I'm, Max Fried was one of the names that was mentioned in the Discord. Max Fried has looked terrible. But if you look below the surface numbers of Max Fried, doesn't look bad. He's got what well, I think I wrote about yesterday. What is this? Batting average of balls and plays 524? Come on. Come on. I think Max Fried is an excellent target. Excellent target. Because whoever has Max Fried on their team now is super pissed at Max Fried. They probably started him both times out and they've gotten horrid results. They're probably talking to themselves into, oh, everyone's hurt. Everyone sucks pitching. Uh, I think he's a perfect guy to make an offer for because you don't have to pay full price. And there's still a, very, still a very reasonable expectation that he'll return to at least being useful, if not far better than that. So don't play the game scared. You're not going to win if you play the game scared. It's just, that's you know, you got to go for it. And I just wanted to hit on that because, again, I thought maybe I had contributed somewhat to people being nervous about, you know, pitching and everything, which I am fair to be nervous about pitching, but you got to go for it. So don't play the game of fantasy baseball or any fantasy sport for that matter scared. Uh, Jackson Holiday, just to check in, uh, had a write-up on fantasyguru.com yesterday. Talked about him on the, the show yesterday in, in, in great detail. Um, had the audiogram from SiriusXM when I talked about him there. So lots of coverage that you can find all of it in the article, the Rays Rambling piece yesterday, or you can find it on yesterday's uh, show, which is episode 117. Uh, batted ninth, played second base, you know, had an RBI, didn't get a hit, strikeouts. So, you know, it was just a fine first game. You know, that's no big deal. Uh, do note that I said he hit ninth, which he did. And it's very likely he'll hit down at the bottom of the order, at least until he really gets going here, because, you know, obviously the Orioles have a very good lineup. And there's still some question about does he play every day? There's still some question about how many left-handed pitchers do they sit him against? Is it all left-handed pitchers to start? Is it only certain left-handed pitchers? So something to think about with Jackson Holiday. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to follow him. Obviously, the number one offensive prospect in the sport. Uh, he's up and up and running, and, and we'll see how the Orioles handle things moving forward with him. I wanted to talk about uh, Arigetti too, uh, who also made his major league debut yesterday uh, for the Astros. I saw a couple of people commenting about you know picking him up, and someone commented this morning that they started him. He gave up seven runs in three innings against the Royals, and it wasn't good. It was not a good effort. He walked three guys. Uh, we talked about him. I wrote about him. Uh, Eric Getty, just to review, one of the, he's one of the upper-end pitching prospects with the Astros. Got a great slider. Huge concerns about control. And as I mentioned, um, there, is, there, are, there is some potential for him to end up in the bullpen long-term because of the lack of control. And we saw that yesterday. He needed 79 pitches to get through three innings. He walked three guys. He gave up the seven runs. Just as a refresher course, I would never – and again, there's scenarios where I would. But when I say never, I'm talking 90% of the time. Never use a rookie in his first major league start. Just, it, it just in general, it's a bad idea. And in the case of Arigetti, I wouldn't have used him anyway, regardless, just to, you know, as we discussed here, as I wrote about, uh, I still have questions about where he's at at this point of his development. But uh, it was a rough first outing. We'll see. We still haven't heard on Framber Valdez. We don't know how much time he's going to miss. So we're anticipating Arigetti holding down that rotation spot. Short term, at least, and then we'll see. Uh, but yeah, that was that was a rough first effort at the hands of the Royals. It did not go well for the pitcher making his debut yesterday. There are teams that are doing well. There are teams that are not doing well. And one of the teams that's not doing well had a, a wager yesterday. It was eleven runs for uh, the Rockies and Diamondbacks in Colorado. Henry versus Gomber. Like this is, you know, Mash City Zone. It was 11 runs. I took the over. I think Jeff Mann's had a parlay where it was 10 and a half. Ended up being eight runs. Uh, just not good. I mean, just, just bleh. And it brings up an issue with the Rockies that they're just not hitting. Colorado or not, they're not hitting. Now, Ryan McMahon's killing it. Charlie Blackman's doing a really good job. Ezekiel Tovar, too. Well, Ray, you just said they're not hitting. Well, they have three guys that are hitting. And I guess we could go Elias Diaz. Okay, so they got four guys that are hitting. Really, though, I mean, this lineup is not – it's just not getting it done. Let me pull up the stats here. Um, if you look at the plate appearance of totals, we have 
Nolan Gorman with a 227 Woba. We have Chris Bryant with a 209 Woba. We have Brendan Rodgers with a 193 Woba. We've got Montero with a 201 Woba. Like these are some terrible numbers. Uh, Rodgers has been demoted to seventh from the cleanup spot. Chris Bryant's hitting 100. Nolan Jones, who um, has solid batted ball data to date, isn't producing. He's hitting 157. Big issue for him is the 40% strikeout rate. He's not putting the ball in play. That's scary bad. Um, there's still plenty of time for this to even out, to equalize, and all that kind of stuff. But the fact is, this team is struggling. And even though they're in cores right now, ugh. Um, I think guys like Bryant, Rodgers, and Jones are still guys you want to hold if you can, especially Bryant and Jones. Rodgers, okay. Maybe I'm just dreaming and that'll never happen. Jones, absolutely, of course. And I think Brian, who's already had some issues at the back, and okay, there's a little concern there. I think it's fair to have that concern. I'm still holding, again, I'm not panicking over 45 plate appearances. Like, I just don't think that's enough to draw a firm conclusion. I will say, again, that half the Rockets lineup is hitting, half it just isn't. Um, the, the tonic, of course, field is not working in the early going here. Uh, so just put it out there. Um, you got to decide what that means for your team. If you've got questions, let me know. Um, but... I'm still bullish overall, but it's just been a struggle today. Uh, Joe Adele, I mean, <laughs> did you see this yesterday? Joe Adele was, has been one of the upper end prospects in baseball. Joe Adele, mere days ago, three days ago, turned 25. There was a period of time in baseball history where, you know, 25 year olds would have a really good 25 year old would have 500 plate appearances in his career. Like that's just, you know. And right now, because of the way Adele's been used, he's been up and down and up and down and up. And down. He's only got 636 plate appearances, okay? He was at one time the number one Angels prospect. His power is like 70, 75 on the 2080 scale. He can mash. He's also had horrible defensive efforts at times. Yesterday, he had a horrible effort on the base pass. He stole a base, or, well, tried to steal a base. Ran, didn't slide ran past second base when he tried to stop and was tagged out. I mean, so technically he got a steal because then he ran past them. So at least he got the steal from the fantasy perspective. He had two hits yesterday, he hit a home run, home run and a steal yesterday, showing the goodness of him. And then on the negative side, didn't slide at second base, ran past second base and got tagged out. He needs to be in a new spot. Like, I just don't think it's going to work out with the Angels. I don't know if it's going to work out with anybody. I just, I don't know. Because it's like every step he takes forward, there's always the negative with him. Again, he's still 25. He's still tremendously talented. He's still got massive power. He's still built like a football player. Like all these things are still there. But boy, that's just, that is rough to watch. I'll tell you that. Uh, Jose Soriano, his teammate, was transitioned into the pitching, uh, the starting rotation, excuse me, for the Angels. Uh, previously, he had made 40 outings out of the bullpen in his career. It was his first major league start yesterday. How did he do? Well, he threw four innings, gave up four runs. Didn't walk anybody and had six strikeouts. So that's a positive. The four runs allowed, the home run, okay, obviously it's a negative. Soriano has got what the kids today call a live arm, okay? He throws he throws really hard. Um, his average fastball velocity is about 98 miles an hour as a big leaguer. He uh, throws his curveball extremely hard. His curveball comes in at like 87. So he's got stuff. We'll see, you know, again, he's a two-pitch pitcher. He's a young guy. He doesn't have the experience to start at the big league level. Moderate results in that first effort. He's a guy to dream on. He's really, like, I don't, even if you're in a 15-team mix league, are you adding Jose Seriano? No, no. But all it's going to take is, is one six-inning effort where he has nine strikeouts and allows one run where people are going to start talking about us. So remember, you heard it. You heard us talking about him here, so put him on a watch list. Jose Soriano of the Angels, but uh, now's not really a time to make a move there. Uh, Jordan Hicks, on the other hand, I don't know if Jordan Hicks is possibly available in, on your league. I mean, he's drafted in all my leagues, but maybe he's still not available in your league. Maybe we're in a shallow league. And I've talked about him, and I don't know where he's going to be in August. I don't know if he's going to be in the bullpen. I don't know if they're going to shut him down because of the workload at some point. But who cares right now? He's dealing. And he's 2-0. and He's pitched 18 innings in his three starts, which is fantastic. Uh, he's only allowed a total of three runs, two of them earned. He's pitched terrific. Now, for a guy that throws 95-plus, he is throwing slower now that he's in the rotation versus out of the bullpen. 13 strikeouts in 18 innings, you know, 19.7% strikeout rate is not good. It's not even league average. But we'll take it because, you know, he, he's got a 56% ground ball rate. No one is squaring him up. He's giving depth in the starts right now. 
Uh, there, there's nothing to dislike about what we see here. He's increased his split finger usage, so he's becoming more of a three-pitch guy than a two-pitch guy. All positives with Hicks. The caveat being workload with him, still absolutely something to think about long-term, but short-term, Jordan Hicks is just killing it for the Giants. Uh, Lance Lynn, how did Lance Lynn do yesterday? Well, let's pull up Lance Lynn. Lance Lynn, who threw innings last year and had strikeouts last year, also allowed a gazillion home runs last year and had horrid ratios, goes to St. Louis this year. First game, shut out over four innings. Second game, four runs and four and two-thirds innings. Nah. Yesterday against Phillies, two runs, but neither earned. Four or five innings. So we have three innings, a 13.2 innings over three starts, which is low for him. I'm assuming this is early season and the Cardinals aren't going to be that hyper vigilant with his workload. But he does have 18 strikeouts and 13 in uh, two thirds innings. Stills allowed those three home runs. Still unclear how much of the old Lance Lynn we're getting back this season. Fully expected to be better than last year. Uh, I think that it's fair to look at his 2022 levels and say, yeah, we can get that guy. Um, maybe with a little more whip. I'm not sold on the 1-1 whip for him anymore. Let's call it a 1-2 whip. But I think the overall returns with Lynn to date are more positive than negative. They're not great, but they're more positive than negative. Uh, Chris Paddock, uh, you know, I had someone ask today, do I drop Chris Paddock? Depends on your move. Uh, I don't think that Chris Paddock in his couple of starts for the Twins this year has done anything that leads me to think there's danger here. Uh, there's a player profile on him over at fantasyguru.com. He's allowed two runs in both of his outings. Unfortunately, he's walked uh, two guys in both outings, which is odd. I expect that to change. He's really a guy that limits the walk. Um, only got eight and two-thirds innings. They all said, as the article, the, the player profile talked about, he's going to throw 140-plus innings this year. They all said it. That was I had like three or four quotes from people in the organization saying, at least 140, we're looking at 160. I'm like, okay. So I don't know how much of this early season is we're not going to let him face the order three times through. This is us protecting him a little bit early in the season. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think the early returns, again, are positive, kind of like Lance Lynn. Nothing jumps off the page is, wow, this has been great. There's some negatives here. But I think overall he's been healthy. He's taken the ball. And I think that the early returns are suggestive that, you know, if he's a depth piece in a deeper mixed league, I think you're in an okay spot. Uh, Bobby Miller. What about Bobby Miller? Bobby Miller, I got a question about him in Discord this morning as well. Uh, the Dodgers hurler, who is, to this point of his career has been absolutely fantastic, uh, in his first outing was stellar against the, the Cardinals, 11 strikeouts over six shutout innings, then got bombed against the Cubs, gave up five runs while only getting four outs or five outs, excuse me. How did he do yesterday against Minnesota? Disappointing. Four innings of work. He walked three guys, gave up a couple of runs, including a home run. The Twins are not hitting. And so that was a matchup where it certainly seemed like Bobby Miller would have more success than he did. You know, all told, you know, we're we're looking at 18 strikeouts and 11 and two-thirds innings, which is absolutely phenomenal. But he's, he has allowed those two runs. He's walked six guys, and that's the real issue thus far. His walk rate from last year to this year has literally doubled. It's three outings. I'm not anticipating that continuing. Uh, I still think that Bobby Miller's fine. Let's not panic. Let's not get nervous. Um, but he's – I was reading something this morning about his slider. He's changed the shape of his slider a little bit because he's throwing it harder. Seems like he's having a hard time controlling it in their first couple of starts here this season. So look for him to get that slider under control. And if he does probably have that success come back that we're used to seeing from him. Uh, Garrett Cole update. Garrett Cole is supposed to throw today. He's supposed to throw 25 pitches today, trying to come back from the elbow issue. 25 throws. Um, we'll see. Like it's nothing fancy. It's nothing fantastic. It's like a step. They are all saying the right things with him. He's saying the right things. He was interviewed the other day. Well, he said some of the wrong things about pitch clocks and stuff like that, but um, his, his physical situation appears to be improving. We'll see what he does today. Uh, again, 25 throws, that's something I do with my dog when I go to the park every night. That's not a big deal. Uh, but it's a good good news to hear that we're moving forward with Mr. Cole. Another pitcher who seems to be in, in a zone where he's not really moving forward. They're saying he's not moving backwards, but let's break this down. It's the Mets cross town, the Mets Kodai Senga. He was transferred to the 60-day injured list with the right shoulder issue. Now this is not like, I don't consider that a setback, right? Cause we talked about this when the injury occurred, we spent a lot of time discussing the shoulder injury he was dealing with and how I was saying that, look, any, any little hiccup, any little thing, they're going to slow it down. They did. They, they said that, you know, he just wasn't responding as hope didn't really have a setback, but they slowed him down a little bit. I was never anticipating him being out there until June. Anyway, the Mets had tried to say, well, he'll, he, there's a chance he's back in late May. Well, 
you know, he, he could return on the 27th of May now. So I guess technically he still could return in May. Um, here's what the manager, Carlos Mendoza, said. Quote, we've been slow playing it from the beginning. We took the extra couple of weeks before he started playing catch at the end of spring training. There's nothing new to it. It's just more like where he's at, where we're at. Everything stays the same. Does everything stay the same? You moved him from the 15 day to the 60 day. Does everything stay the same? Eh, I heard what well, we needed the roster spot. Well, you needed the roster spot two weeks ago. Okay. Um, Mendoza also said when asked, hey, can Senga return on the 27th? Or everything's fine. And he hasn't really had a setback. And this is according to plan. You've all said along, all along, he could return in May. There's still a window with the 60 day IL. He can return in May. Is it going to happen? And here's the quote. Quote, it's too early to tell, unquote. So I don't know. I'm not calling it a setback, but as we've discussed with Senga, there was always the chance that this would take longer than than we, longer than the the short estimate said it could have. You know, so it could return. That's exactly what's happened. We're not in the danger zone with him. There hasn't been anything official suggesting a setback. I'm not panicking right now. Again, this is basically playing out the way that I anticipated anyway. Uh, it just seems like it's going to be a little bit later than the Mets led on initially. Uh, to when he's going to be back, though, of course, we have to keep an eye on reports and everything, because when he starts ramping things back up, you know how that can go. Uh, okay. Nico Horner is someone that asked about in the chat room this morning, and they were going to make a trade for Nico Horner. Let's talk about Nico Horner for a second. Nico Horner has been very effective the last two years. Last year, he really took things to the, the next level with the 43 steals. He's going to steal bases. He doesn't have any steals yet. He's going to steal bases. Okay. 43 steals. You shouldn't have drafted him for 43. You should have drafted him for 30. He still can get to 30 steals. He's hit 280 in each of the last three years. He's hitting 139 right now. The problem with Nico Horner when he struggles like he is right now is that he doesn't have power to make up for the lack of base hits, right? You know, he's, his career high in some runs is 10. Joey Gallo, uh, Kyle Schwarber, for example. Kyle Schwarber can go, you know, three days without a base hit, be hitting 190 for the month, and then have three home runs in four days and still give you value, right? And those three home runs could knock in seven runs. It's 11 games played for Nico Horner this year. He has zero RBIs. Zero. It's not just zero home runs. He's got zero RBIs. Now, he still scored eight times in 11 games, which is pretty damn good for a guy that's hitting 139. And note that his on base percentage is 340. It's basically the same as last year. Um, his walk rate is skyrocketed. It's through the roof. It's 17%. It's a massive number. The strikeout rate's basically right on his career average. So we've got a guy who's walking more than he's striking out, still getting on base at a 340 clip, which is actually one point above his career number. So do you make it a, a move to add Horner? Sure. You have to understand who Horner is, though. And that's the problem with these kind of players. Not that they can't earn $25 or be worth a fifth round draft pick or whatever you spend on Nico Horner. But when they struggle, there's nothing to carry them. Because, again, he's never going to hit home runs. He's never going to drive runs in. Um, it's just not. We had 68 RBIs last year. You know, that seems like a forever from here number at this point, right? He's just not that guy. So the the, the numbers should improve across the board. Uh, let's take a look at his batting average of balls of play is 167. Come on, man. Like, even if he stinks this year, it's going to be 267. He is hitting the ball in the air a little bit more than last year, but it's like 1% difference. So basically, he's the same guy. Fact of the matter is that it just hasn't come together for him. His batting average right now could be 239, easy. Again, you know, it still will be down, but it, I have very high level of confidence that the batting average will come back uh, and that he is certainly someone to target at this point if his current owner is panicking because the numbers on the surface just aren't very good. But remember, he's got to be the right fit for your team because there's limitations to his game. Uh, 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 here's another one. Jose Abreu has been dropped in the order. He was down to eighth in the order yesterday for the Astros. We've talked about him. We wrote about him in the preseason. As an aging player, Abreu is just someone that, um, you know, it's just not it's just not likely to happen for him this year. Uh, the, at this point of his career, he's become just a guy. He's lost bat speed. You know, a team can have patience, which they did with him last year, the Astros. But at some point, you just got to say you're not getting it done. So I'm not anticipating a big turnaround for Jose Abreu. And Nathan Lowe is progressing. Uh, he's got an oblique issue that's got him on the sidelines. He took some live BP and ran the bases yesterday. So he's getting very close to uh, joining the uh, minor league circuit there, getting some games under his belt, returning to the Texas Rangers. And don't forget, not in the thing alone. Because, I mean, is he a star? No. Does he do anything great? No. But he's going to play every day for the Rangers. they got a great lineup. they got a great ballpark. And he's very productive. Uh, boring but productive. And sometimes that works in fantasy. Yeah, we've seen it happen, right? Um 
Gavin Sheets. Here's another guy I wanted to talk about. Gavin Sheets. Gavin Sheets is on fire right now. And most of the White Sox are on fire is because of injury. I mean, Makata might be done for the season. Eloy Jimenez is out. Luis Robert is out. Like, this team is just incredibly bad. Um, but Gavin Sheets is the lone bright star right now. He's hitting 333. He's got an 1100 OPS. And it's like, wow, let's go run out and grab Gavin Sheets. Now, the problem with Gavin Sheets is you can run out and grab Gavin Sheets. Totally fine to do that. I have no problem with anyone doing that. But you got to understand what you got. And what you got there in Gavin Sheets is a guy that, A, will never play against left-handed pitching. And, B, if he does play against left-handed pitching, he's going to be absolutely freaking abysmal. His OPS in his career against left-handed pitching is 3-2-4. Not his batting average, not his on-base percentage, not his slugging percentage, his OPS. So Gavin Sheets is a an extremely narrow play in leagues because he can only face right-handed pitching. Even when he faces right-handed pitching, his career slash line is 240, 310, 435, which is league average across the board. I think that if you're if you're adding Gavin Sheets, I you know you better be in an A only league. Even though the numbers look great on the surface, Gavin Sheets is very likely to recede to being at best a league average guy against right-handed pitching. Is that really something you need on a team with the White Sox that you know is just going to be poor offensively? I don't think it is. Hopefully you don't think it is. But I wanted to address it because, again, I mean, his early returns here are absolutely fantastic. He's been killing it. If you want to ride the train for two weeks until he stumbles, I guess you can do it. I wouldn't. I just don't recommend it for the reasons that I've laid out previously. Fantasy Sports Daily here, Monday through Friday at 11 o'clock Eastern time. I also have the Sirius XM show, two Sirius XM shows. One is Elite Sports Game Time, which is 8 to 10, Monday through Thursday. Myself and Justin Fensterman host that show. We'll be on it tonight. And the second show is Elite Sports from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. That's with Jeff Manns. I'm on with him every Wednesday. Okay, so let's transition from some baseball talk. Again, I'll come back to comments and questions that are in the, the, the Discord here, or the chat room, excuse me, at the end of the show. But wanted to change things up. Wanted to stop talking myself because I'm sure I'm tired of listening to myself. I don't know if you're tired of listening to me. Uh, wanted to rejoin the football discussion because, yeah, I know it's early. Yeah, I know. I was actually invited to a industry football draft. Is it Monday? And I'm like, it's the third week of the baseball season, but football never stops. And one of the guys that never stops with that is someone you've seen here on the show, someone we've talked to before, and he's back again to talk some football with us today. That is Russell Clay, our buddy from FantasyGuru.com. Football never does stop, Russell, right? It's amazing. It's 17 games, yet it's 365 days a year. Uh, they have somehow finagled us into covering this every day, uh, every hour uh, day, week, month of the season. Um, as soon as the Super Bowl ends, it's Senior Bowl week, and we just keep rolling from there. So here we are. Yeah, and here you are, and I know that uh, we've got a project behind the scenes we haven't talked about yet that's new and exciting that we'll be discussing and releasing that information soon. Mm. I know that you're writing articles, you're in the you're knee deep in rankings, doing all this stuff as we get uh, get ahead. Looking forward to 2024. Let's start out by uh, talking about the live stream, which you guys do every Tuesday at seven o'clock. Let's just remind the folks that, you know, besides the 15 minutes here that they can hear, they can listen to you for at least an hour every week, too. Yeah, every Tuesday evening, depending on your time zone, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and me, uh, Armando Marsal, sometimes if he's not grinding out the NBA uh, DFS chat, and sometimes early in the show, maybe he is also doing that. Um, Tyler Beaker and Rich Maletto, we go through right now. We're doing team needs heading into the NFL draft, but all off season, uh, this is essentially uh, covering what we're working on, whether it's free agency, NFL draft, dynasty leagues, et cetera. And then during the year, it's basically a Q and a, uh, for waivers, uh, or, you know, whatever your needs are for fantasy football during the in season stuff. And you also do videos yourself. Talk to the listeners and viewers about that too, Russell. Yeah. So every Friday I have an article called Clay's Corner. And uh, usually it's in video form. Sometimes I do interviews. Sometimes I just review the week in content. Uh, and, you know, that's been a fun little adventure for me. I, uh, I am not a producer. Thank you for Sean on Tuesdays, but, uh, you know, we try to, we try our little techie stuff out, uh, on my own little article there on, uh, 
on Fridays. Well, I'm, I'm producing this one, so hopefully I'm doing okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I'm doing either, Russell. I'm just pushing buttons. But uh, being able to talk to you makes me feel better because I know we'll get good information there. Uh, let's start out the discussion about a guy that last year did a lot of great things. Last year also dealt with some injuries. And last year really wasn't on the field that much because of it. Anthony Richardson of the Colts. We're starting to get mm. the reports. Oh, you know, he's feeling better and we're excited. And where are you at with him after that first season, which again had some real highs and some real lows as well. From a fantasy perspective, I am pretty locked in that if he can play over a sustainable amount of time, we're going to get those high end fantasy results. Will he ever play a sustained amount of time? That remains to be seen. And quarterback, wide receiver, running back, a lot of these roles are starting to meld together uh, in, in this new era of football. We now know in the 2020s, run, quarterbacks running is the most almost arguably the most valuable offensive play because uh, there's nobody to guard them unless there's a, a spy on the quarterback. Mm -hmm. And then you got Anthony Richardson, who's 230, 240 pounds on maybe a corner who's 30, 40 pounds smaller or a linebacker who is way slower. So um, Anthony Richardson himself, great system there uh, in Indy, has some really nice weapons at this point, which I don't know that we can say that for the Colts in a very long time. So yeah, really good setup for him. Um, it's just whether he can stay healthy in that role. Another situation at the quarterback spot that I think is kind of messy, but for well, some of the same reasons health-wise, but some other reasons too, is what's going on with Deshaun Watson of the Browns? Because there was a time where he led the league in passing yards. He was considered one of the handful of best quarterbacks in football. Then all the stuff away from the field. Then he came back, got the big contract where he got overpaid. Then he struggled with health. Then he struggled with performance. Where are we at with him? Because, you know, that Browns team's got a lot of talent. And it, it really seems like they have set him up for success in 2024. Remember the simple days, Ray, when it was just young Deshaun Watson and he was just good and we didn't have mm -hmm. to think about it. And, you yep. know, maybe he got an injury here or there, but uh, overall just a great young player. And now it's hard to be, it's hard to root for Deshaun Watson at this point mm -hmm. and not, not only on the field, but off it. Uh, but here we are. I mean, I still am holding out hope that he has the talent. And as you mentioned with that offense, uh, i am Heading into last year, I was like, all right, this is going to be old Deshaun Watson. He's going to crush with this great supporting cast, and we're going to be off to the races. But, uh, you know, I am cautiously optimistic still, but there is a real chance he's just toast. Uh, and I'm still buying at the value because it's so, so cheap now for a guy with his history. But Sometimes the injuries just take a toll and it's, and it's over. And, you know, he's got the, all that other stuff of being, I mean, publicly shamed and all that, who knows what type of an, an effect that had on him. Cause he stunk last year, even before, you know, it came out the shoulder thing. So, um, I'm in fantasy wise, I'm back in, but, um, you know, it could be week two and we could be like, all right, they're going to be looking for somebody else soon. Not holding you to this, Russell, but is he a QB2 or a one in a general sense right now for you? QB2 with, with okay. major upside if he's back. But yeah, QB2 also could be just dropped on your season long uh, you know, team yeah. by week three. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's look broadly by looking at a dynasty setup. That's your main focus. Of course, again, you do all the football. You're a dynasty guy, so you're the right guy to ask this. Running back position. How do we do this? Because, you know, you got on one end, you got a guy like, you know, Raheem Mostert and Derrick Henry. At the other end of the thing, you got B. John Robinson. So there's different styles of play. There's huge age differences. There are all the studies that talk about the fact that when a guy gets work and ages, the body wears down, the performance slips. Is there a drop dead date for you at the running back spot in terms of age or workload numbers? And how much does age play into your dynasty rankings at this position? So age 100% matters 
The problem is uh, when we look at a guy like Derrick Henry, right? Uh, age matters. He's not what he was when he was 25, 26, just getting into that feature role. But um, we don't know who is going to sustain themselves into the later years. Frank Gore is the best example, right? Right. right? Mm-hmm. Like guy who was always banged up, multiple major injuries early in his career. And then hell, he's playing till his mid thirties. And then we have other guys, you know, I always bring up Sean Alexander, but there's tons of examples um, over the last couple of years. Uh, Le'Veon Bell. You Mm -hmm. know, some great years and then they're gone. Great Mm -hmm. years and then they're gone. So there's no real way to know who's going to sustain themselves into their 30s. But yes, it's kind of like the roulette wheel, right? We know 95% of guys are not going to make it past 30. Um, But we do know every generation there's a few. I feel like if there is one candidate, it's Derrick Henry to just keep going. He looks like that guy to me, especially in Baltimore. But, um, you know, yeah, age does matter. The problem I'll tell you now, Ray, I'm having a come to Jesus off season where okay. uh, the systems matter so much more than the players at this point. You know, Dynasty has always been all about, all right, I like this guy. He's going to figure it out. And I came away from this past season where it's like these systems are so powerful now. Puka Nakua, Puka Nakua last year is going to outproduce Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, and all these great prospects coming in this year because it's like the Rams system is so much more powerful than how good uh, Calvin Johnson or anything is. It's like, all right, I love Marvin Harrison. Is he going to do what Puka did last year? No. So, um, yeah, so get the right system in. It's more, you know, guys like Jeff Manns and you guys and, you know, the offensive line breakdowns and coaching breakdowns. It's always been important, but I've always kind of been like, all right, but the players matter. And right. now I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't know, fellas, like is 30 year old Raheem Mostert better than Brees Hall? I don't know. So, yeah. Russell Clay, Ray Flowers here. Uh, you can follow Russell on Twitter X at Russell J. Clay. That's correct, right? Yep. Okay, at least I want to make sure I got that right. Um, I mentioned Raheem Mostert. You talked about him. I mean, Raheem Mostert had a season for the ages last year. He's 100 years old. Now, uh, unlike a lot of other 100-year-olds, he doesn't have a lot of work, but he's got a gazillion injuries. Right. Everyone is going to say, and everyone's everyone's been saying since like December of last year, and it's gone on, oh, he can't, re- can't sustain it, can't repeat it. We all know that. Do you get the sense, though, that let's talk redraft league. Do you get the sense, though, that everyone's going to be so much against him that maybe drafting him is not going to be the worst thing in the world? Because A-chan, 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 A-chan. You know what I mean? It's like, are, is the industry going to talk itself into Raheem Mostert's going to suck so much that you might actually have some shares in 2024? We we actually did the AFC East, NFC East on the, on the live stream on Tuesday, and when we got to the Dolphins depth chart, I just started laughing and I was like, all right, Armando, you're our Miami guy. Uh, look at these guys on this depth chart. I mean, a chan's awesome, but they have these, this random assortment of fast guys. Mm-hmm. And if we look at this Mike McDaniel system going back to his other teams as well, it's kind of like he just gets the fast guy and then it works. Right. So uh yeah, I mean if Raheem Mostert's getting 200 touches in this offense again, um it's ugly on your dynasty roster, 31 year old running back. But you know when he's getting 30 points, you're not going to care about that. So um yeah, you know I do like Achan, but ultimately uh, if we go into the year and it's those two again, yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah, I have Mostert on my dynasty team. That's why I have my hand. I've had him for years. I didn't pick him up last year. So I you know, right. wasn't expecting what I saw last year with the depth guy. But um, let's shift things over to the wide receiver position. And, you know, figure like having you on here. We got to talk about Rasheed Rice. Um, there's an arrest warrant issued. He's got six counts of, you yeah. know, stemming from the car accident. No one knows what this could mean. He could, he could see jail time. He may not see jail time. He could be suspended. He may not be suspended. I've gotten a bunch of questions about what to do with him in dynasty setups. How are you viewing this situation right now when it's really 
totally up in the air and we don't have a good handle on what's going on with Rasheed Rice. Okay. So lay it on us, Russell. Ray, the Tyree Kill thing left a burning tattoo on my brain. Okay. Because there was a few days in the Tyree Kill thing where he was getting traded for future second round picks. He was, people were just trying to get off the falling knife. His career was over. He's going to jail for five years. Right. This is a wrap. And then it wasn't. And then we had all these trades. There was like a two day window where people just got him for nothing. And I'm not saying don't trade Rasheed Rice. I actually did downgrade him in the dynasty ratings uh, over on Fantasy Guru this past week. I dropped him a bunch of points. I dropped him a tier or two. And I said, hey, if you can get anyone in this equivalent tier, I'm all for it. But this is a falling knife. And you don't want to be the guy to sell him for nothing and then have nothing happen. And then just, just it be week three and he's catching passes from Patrick Mahomes and 23 years old. Um, so yes, yeah, sell him if you want for a reasonable price, but don't just give him away. I'd rather hold to zero and just be like, it's over then just give him up for nothing and have, you know, Bob, in my dynasty league, just beat the hell out of me the next three years. Cause he, uh, <laughs> cause he got him for nothing. Right. For me. Yeah. I've received so. rights in my dynasty. League. We have IDP. It's 50 roster spots. It's like a full yeah. NFL team. I've got him. And I never thought for one second about trying to trade him. Like I'm just, I'm riding it out. And if it goes completely, it goes completely. But you know, my point to the people I've talked to about is like, you don't know. I don't know. We don't know. It could be a three game suspension. It right. could be a four-game suspension. It could be three years. He could end up in jail. We don't know. It could be, end up being a blip on the radar. He could become a model citizen thereafter and, you know, talk for GLAD and do all these things. I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's – I would caution people, too. When you don't have all the information, making a move out of fears – and I talked about that earlier today in the show, too. Making fear-based moves is just not where you want to be. Um, Staying at the wide receiver position, Russell, <laughs> Doug Peterson, and it's coach – we have this thing called coach speak. We all know what that is. So the coach says everything's fine when it's not fine. Um, yeah. They they went out and signed the Jaguars, d- Gabe Davis, to a three or $39 million deal, ostensibly to replace Calvin Ridley in the offense. Doug Peterson, the head coach of the Jaguars, came out and said that Gabe Davis is a Swiss Army knife for this offense. What the hell does that mean? Or is that, does that mean they're going to line him up in the backfield? He's going to play tight end? He's going to play quarterback? Are they going to go wishbone? Like, what? what? Come on. We know what Gabe Davis is, don't we? Is this a sign that the Jaguars think he'd be something that none of the rest of us do? That that would be the worst Swiss Army knife ever. <laughs> <laughs> Just the one, the one straight kind of bland. Right? That one, yeah. yeah. The butter knife, the butter <laughs> knife. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no. We know what Gabe Davis is going to do. Ever since college, I mean, he's straight line. And he's good at it. You know, he's a good deep threat. And uh, as long as he's out there, teams have to adjust for it. But no, I mean, if we're if we're out there and Gabe Davis is running, you know, like screens and Mm -hmm. like we're in trouble uh, as as Jaguars folks, uh, if that is the case. But uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm not in on that. Christian Kirk, great in that role. Mm -hmm. Zay Jones, pretty solid as well. Evan Ingram, they do not need Gabe Davis to do anything other than run go routes. Okay, so don't that's coach speak. We both agree on that. Yeah. Um, what about the pick situation with the Packers? Christian Watson, another potentially dynamic player, a guy who we've seen flash, yeah. a guy who's had huge games, scored all these touchdowns and bunches, and then vanished from the offense because he's on the sidelines with a hamstring injury. And then returns and then vanishes from the offense because he's got a hamstring injury. He's gone to a special lab, which again, I don't know why it took so long to do some real de- in depth analysis here because he's been dealing with this for a while. He's trying desperately to figure out what's going on with his hamstrings and why he can't stay healthy. And with all the biometrics we deal with in baseball all the time, guys can go out and gain velocity and spin rates. Of course, they can model a body and look at you and do all these things. So it's good that he's doing that. On to the football aspect of things in 2024. What is Christian Watson? An upwardly mobile offense, a guy that's had huge efforts, a quarterback that really flashed last year. We've seen it, but even if we get all these positive report, reports that Watson's changed his running style and his training methods, like, 
how do you value him heading into 2024? So the big problem for Christian Watson is that after 2023, this offense has shifted from, all right, this has to be our main guy to, all right, well, if you're healthy, we're in. But if you're not, we have Jaden Reed to do all the stuff uh, that you sort of were meant to do. I don't think they drafted Reed purely because of the Watson injury stuff, but I thir- I I think it was a factor at the very least. They play somewhat similar roles, obviously very different builds, but Jaden Reed is a very very good all-purpose all threat. Uh if we could get both of those guys on the field at the same time, we're we're cooking, but uh overall um that's the biggest problem for Watson and I think that's why there's such an initiative this offseason cuz it's like man this Jaden Reed guy came in and looked like Debo uh well, I got to get I got to get things going here or you know I'm probably going to be out of here after my rookie deal so uh that's what I would be concerned about for Watson even if he is healthy going to be hard to keep Wa- going to be hard to keep Reed off the field Yeah and with Watson by the way your cat just showed up yeah, him. that's Norm, right? Norm. What do you think? Norm just he walked in real quiet like and just laid down. I like it. He didn't like my cat would have walked in and yelled. Um, so I, I like how old's Norm? Norm is eight months. Wow, Norm is full grown for eight months. Wow, he's a big boy. Yeah, uh someone someone floated the idea that he might be a, a main coon, okay, and that that could be a problem. I didn't know I was signing up for a 20 pound cat, but yeah, uh I- We'll see. We'll see. Friendly or standoffish? Friendly, but you know, when you first meet him, he'll go run under the bed or something and and scope you out from out. Yeah, that's all right. That's what cats normally do. Hey, Norm. Yeah. Thanks for joining the show today. Um, final question for you, uh, Russell. Before we let you go, Russell Clay of FantasyGuru.com. Chargers made all kinds of changes. They got a new head coach. They got a new OC. They're bringing guys in for the backfield. They're it certainly seems like this, I don't know if run first is the right way to say it, but this is going to be a balanced offense, if you will. That's how they want to run it. What does that do with Justin Herbert? Because a lot of people I've seen, in, especially in, yeah. the, in a dynasty or keeper scenario, they're getting really nervous. Like, oh, my God, he's going to be throwing it 29 times to 39 times a week. What are you thinking with Justin Herbert? So I think the number one storyline rooting interest for me heading into the draft is, can the number five spot get – Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison, or hell, even Brock Bowers. Any of those guys, and I'm all the way back in on Justin Herbert. If they do something random, now they have signed Gus Edwards. They have kind of, they've, they let go of Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Mm -hmm. So if they don't go skill guy at five, then it could be Jim Harbaugh's battening down the hatches and we're going to run it 400 times this year. If, okay. if that happens, if no wide receiver at five, then yeah, I, I'm going to be tempering expectations for Justin Herbert at five, but that is, that is the point right there. That draft pick is going to tell us what we need to know about that, that wide receiver room. I don't know if you guys saw that uh, interview where he was asked about the wide receiver room and he just was like, Oh, that's cause there's just, <laughs> There's nothing in there. I mean, there's Josh Palmer. Love Josh Palmer, mm-hmm. but he's like a 700, 800 max receiving yards guy. Uh, the rest is, you know, we need Malik Neighbors or Marv in there. So that's what I'm rooting for. But yeah, if not, we have we know Jim Harbaugh's game. He did it at Michigan the last four years, and he did it with the 49ers and Kaepernick before. He likes to run. So yeah. We're 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 cautiously optimistic, but I totally would not be surprised if there's just a an O lineman meant to be in the 30s drafted top five. So there you go. Russell Clay of fantasyguru.com. You can see it on the screen there. Get the off-season franchise mode package, which includes all this talk that we're going through here, Pre- previews of players, player profiles leading up to the draft, the reviews of all the free agent movements, all that kind of stuff. Get that package right now, 1999. And that includes stuff from Russell Clay. You can hear him on uh, Fridays when he's doing his, what, what's it called? Russell's Clay's Corner. Corner. Clay's Corner. Clay's Corner. Sorry. Clay's Corner. And uh, then there's a live stream on uh, Tuesdays as well at seven o'clock Eastern time with him and the crew. So appreciate you coming on and, and sharing some time with us, Russell. Uh, go say hi to Norm. Give him a little pet on the belly. Watch yourself when you pet the belly. Is he good with the belly pet or no? Because my cat isn't. 
good with the belly pet to a point and then he's like listen here pal yeah. this is uh this is a negotiation yeah. now <laughs> more head scratches please okay that's it. usually safer at that region too for me <laughs> yeah. too so i get the point um thanks for spending time with us today really appreciate it uh, and we'll talk to you again soon russell thanks ray all right you got it russell clay of fantasyguru.com find him at on twitter x at russell j clay a few more moments left here in the show let's see if we got any comments here we go uh, let's seize the day, says Tony C. Let's seize it. I, I've been up since yesterday, it feels like, so hopefully we can do that. Um, H Henry Vargas says the entire Astros rotation from 2022 World Series is on the IL. Baseball in 2024. Um, we'll have to see if we get any update today on Framber Valdez. We did get good news with Justin Verlander. He's you know, trending toward a return in the near future. But, yeah, they're dealing with tons of injuries. And then finally, a question from Steve Davis. Good morning, Ray. Question about Cubs players. Michael Bush, the real deal. He was great in the minors, but never really had playing time on the Dodgers. He's looked really good. When people ask that, and I know why they ask that, because it's a catchy, cool thing to say, what is the real deal? I always I always ask people, what does that mean to you? Is real deal mean he's a Hall of Famer? Does it mean he's an all-star? Does it mean he's a good player? Like, I think the way I would answer the question of where is you know, Michael Bush is that he's had a good start, as you suggested. He's had a really good start to the season. You look at his numbers across the board, they're solid. Strikeout rate is 25%, reasonable, 850 OPS. He's driven the baseball pretty well. Really like to see the walk rate of 14%. Uh, the batted ball data is not over the top, but it's solid. I think that Michael Bush is likely to play most of the time for the Cubs. And I think we're looking at a 250-2075 kind of season. Uh, I don't think that's a real deal. Maybe it is. Again, it depends on what your expectations asking the question are. I think Michael Bush will be an effective corner infield option in deep mixed leagues. I don't think he's likely to be more than that. Could be wrong. Early returns are positive. Let's see how he continues to go. But more of just a guy in a mixed league scenario. Uh, maybe we can get more from him, though, as he develops and gets more time at the big league level. So there's the show today, folks. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. In. Monday through Friday from 8 to oh, – excuse me. Monday through Friday, 8 o'clock Pacific time, which is 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We're here on Fantasy Sports Daily. Don't forget to watch the Elite Sports Show from 12 or listen to the Elite Sports Show from 3 to 6 Monday through Friday Eastern Time on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. And then from 8 to 10 Monday through Thursday on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. It's Elite Sports Game Time with myself and Justin Fensterman. I'm going to head over to the website now and get the closer grid updated. So look for that today. If you're talking about a seasonal aspect of things with baseball, I'll be on the show with Justin later tonight. Uh, the cash game breakdown is up right now. If you want to risk it today in that small slate in Major League Baseball, again, I think you should just play GPP, but you can at least maybe pull some information from that article from the G, uh, G uh, for GPP setup today uh, from the DFS angle from that cash game breakdown article from earlier this morning. Thanks for listening today. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks to Russell Clay as well for joining us tomorrow. We'll talk some baseball, maybe sneak in a little NASCAR with Fantasy Bosco, Rich Bolito. We'll see if we can work that out. If not, we'll just go all baseball. Thanks for listening today. Appreciate it. We'll be back in 23 hours here for Fantasy Sports Daily, powered by fantasyguru.com.